morning good afternoon and welcome to the uh, day 2 of equip 2023 this is the first plenary session after an exciting uh, you know talk yesterday we are all eager to get on with the program today we start with a uh, uh, welcome remarks from professor arnav bhattacharya Zarna Bhattacharya is a professor and science communicator at PIFR and the center director of the Homi Bhabha Center for Science Education, which is hosting this conference. He has broad interests ranging from semiconductor optoelectronics to frugal solutions for global health and education. He pioneered Chai and Why, Mumbai's popular science cafe, and also coordinates PIFR's public reach and public outreach activities. In this role, he has pushed to ensure gender equity in PIFR's outreach activities and organize science demonstration programs with a focus on girls in schools in underserved communities. He was awarded the Indira Gandhi Prize for popularization of science by INSA in 2017. I now welcome uh, Prof. Arunab Bhattacharya to give a few remarks, and I would like to remind you when I invite him that we are having this session in Marriott Law Hall. as we told you yesterday each session is hold uh, is organized in different halls and information about this hall of fame you will find on our webpage so welcome arnav and over to you thank you uh, vandana and good day everyone morning afternoon evening wherever in the world you are watching from good day thank you for joining us at equip and I am delighted to add a word of welcome from the Homi Bhabha Center of Science Education (HBCSE), the institution that is, you know, we are thrilled to be the hosts. As such, it's an online event, but still the hosts of Equip 2023. Now, HBCSE has had a very long history in looking at different issues of gender and science, not physics, but beyond that, science in particular, you know, overall. And this started off way back in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of work done by uh, professor sugra chunawala starting off with collaborations with the government of maharashtra looking at tribal regions there looking at career choices that girl students made looking at the interventions if telling them about vocational guidance would would uh, help eventually we got funding from the national government the department of science and technology to examine the uh, curricular textbooks at central schools in india from the grade 3 onwards to see uh how scientists and you know were represented gender representations etc this led then to an exhibition on gender and science a book on gender and science um eventually there was a a position paper written by some of our faculty members on technology education and issues of gender this was uh, 2003 so there's been a very long history fast forward 20 years we are now in the era of a, another very interesting program that we run called vigyan vidushi you heard a bit of this from the director tifr yesterday this is a bespoke mentoring program for uh, women physics students at the masters level where they come here uh, there are of course you know lectures and lab sessions that get them sort of up to speed with the best that is there in um, you know physics at the msc level to learn but more than that there are a lot of very interesting mentorship sessions held by women in physics that actually prepares them for the journey ahead for a career ahead all the things that they might face and also forms networks of this and this has been extremely successful in seeing the number of these students who are then going on to phd programs both coming to us in the tifr system and to other institutions in india and beyond so we are an institution that is committed to equity and excellence that's our motto in the sciences and this of course extends to gender equity as well and uh, hence we are very very happy that equip is finally happening not just in india but that hbcse is the host for this thing so i wish you all fantastic deliberations yesterday was a really great learning experience and i'm sure the next few days both in the poster sessions and the talks are going to be a great uh, opportunity for all of us to listen to the best across the world thank you very much thank you arna for this uh, very uh, nice welcome and uh, i'm sure a lot of people uh, here around participants will be interested in the activities of hbcs i now invite 
Professor April Hodari to chair today's session and start the process. Over to you all. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm happy to be here to chair this plenary session and to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm gonna start off with, um, with Raja Turkawi El Morsley um, and just give you her biography. Um, she received her PhD in nuclear physics in France in 1982 and then joined the University Mohammed at Rabat later in 1996. She served as head of the laboratory of nuclear physics. She was vice president of UM5 from 2013 to 2017. She was part of official Morocco's forerunners um, participants in the Atlas collaboration at CERN in Geneva in 1996. She is a member of the board of trustees of the Moroccan Agency for Safety and Nuclear Security and of the National Center for Nuclear Energy Science and Technology of the National Center for Scientific and technical research. In 2015, she received the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. And she was also assigned as a resident member at the Hassan II Academy of Science and Technology and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. In 2018, she was elected a fellow of the TWAS. In 2019, she was elected vice president of the board of NASAC. In 2022, she was nominated as a member of the European Academy of Science and Art. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing her talk and I invite you all to, um, to watch. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you April. Just give us a second to get the talk started. everyone. Uh, I am uh, Raja Sherkawi. Uh, I am professor at the Mohammed V University in Rabat and uh, I am also a member of uh, the Hassan II um, Second uh, Academy of uh, Science and Technology in Morocco. Uh, first, I would like uh, to thank uh, the EUPAP uh, Working Group uh, Women in Science to invite me to participate to this important uh, conference. Thank you. And uh, now, please let me share with you my uh, my presentation. So, uh, my presentation. Uh, is about I will present my research journey, my uh, challenges and uh, achievements in the field uh, of uh, physics. In this uh, presentation, I, I am going to talk about my my research. But after an introduction, I will give by presenting some challenges I faced uh, pursuing a career in physics, and then I will move to talk about my achievement and uh, research. And of course, uh, I will quote some uh, award and nominations. Finally, I will give my conclusion with some recommendation. So let's get start. Mm. Can you guess what is behind this door? Actually, behind this door, you can find one of the oldest library in the world. The library is seated in, uh, Fes, in town Fes in Morocco. It is uh, inside uh, the first university uh, in the world, Al Qarawin. Al Qarawin was found in 859 by an Arab woman, Fatima Al Fihriya, who was one of the first women who were interested in science. It is thanks to her that different scientific subjects were taught at this university, such as theology, mathematics, philosophy, astrology, 
and so on. After, unfortunately, after the period situation of women regressed a lot. No, uh, please look to the, the United Nations Agenda uh, 2030. Uh, as you can see, uh, the goals, the United Nations Global Goals Framework aims mainly uh, at reducing inequality in the world. And this can be only achieved if there are more women involved in science. Uh, and it is clearly shown in uh, SDG's goal 4, 5, 9, and 17. Now, if you look to the agenda of uh, 2063 of uh, the of, uh, African Union, it's different. Huh? Uh, two years before, the African Union had really developed uh, a long-term, 50 years huh, framework agenda called Agenda 2063, which was divided into st stage. And um, the first 10 years uh, implementation plan put plan put focus on science, technology, and innovation. And once again, this can be achieved only if women are involved. Now, I would like to present some challenges I faced while pursuing a career in physics. The first challenge was to convince my father to do long scientific studies and to continue my studies in France after my baccalaureate. Really, it is why it is it was like going to planet Mars. At this time, the only possibility for girls to leave their family was to get married. Getting married was the last thing I was thinking of. I have I had one dream to continue my study abroad. For the family, uh, it is. I think it's the same problem in the world for all women. It is not easy to keep a balance between family and work. My work is very demanding. I have to travel very often, leaving my family alone. And this was not well accepted by my entourage. The difficulties are related to social and cultural mentality. But thanks to the support of my husband, my mother, and my sister, I was able to carry out my research. In the workplace, also I was treated in the same way as a man at work. I always had the feeling as a woman that I was judged more severely than a man. Regarding my research, the biggest challenge was first, to involve Morocco in the International Atlas collaboration. At this time, it's very difficult. Now, Morocco is a member of others' collaboration. All the things change. And also to be a partner in the design and constructions of one of the Atlas subdetector. And now, let me, please let me focus to my last research. Here, what we are doing. In general, we try to understand the history of the universe uh, through cosmologic, cosmological observation, like thanks to telescope, for example, or by trying to create extreme experimental conditions. We are working in the, on the second case. We are trying to go back to the beginning to listen to, uh, to a billion of a second after the Bing Bong. For that, we, we use an accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, which will create this condition. Before talking about the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, let me present you briefly the standard model of elementary particle. If the universe did not exist, 
it will be have to be invited it will have to be invited but what with what what are the elementary blocks that makes up make up map matter this is the question that particle physics tries to answer the adventure really began at the beginning of the last century with the discovery of uh, the first elementary particle, the electron and the photon, and continued for several decades. And in 1960s, a model emerged that will be later called the standard model of particle physics. This model claims to explain the universe using about 30 particles. All of these particles was discovered experimentally, and the last one, the last one, the Higgs boson, who, who, whose existence was predicted in 1964, explained the mass of other particles, was discovered in 2012 at CERN in Geneva. How we do experimental particle physics? The basic idea is very simple. We will use the equivalence between mass and energy. You take two particles and make them collide. The energy that will be released will create other massive particles like the Higgs boson for a very short time. And then they will disintegrate to give other particles. It is thought through decay pro products that you, you will uh, trust their properties. And of course, we will do that thanks to the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is, uh, at, uh, is situated at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. And uh, it is the largest accelerator in the world. Uh, imagine a 27 kilometers tunnel, bird 100 meters deep, and in which Protons circulate at 99.999% of the speed of light, so near the speed of light. We managed to create for a short time what happened just after the Bing Bang. This proton, we make them collide face to face, producing a new particle. Proton collide at four point at the level of four experimental LSC. You have Atlas, CMS, Alice, and LSCB along the accelerator ring, of course. And our Moroccan team is working on the Atlas detector. Our experiment is the same. Let me uh, describe briefly the Atlas experiment. Atlas is not the mountain of Atlas, is the acronym of a toroidal LHC apparatus. At 46 meters long, 25 high and 25 wide, the Atlas detector is the largest volume particle detector ever construed. Of ever construed. Its site, it sits, it uh, sits is in the cavern, I will say before, 100 meters below the ground near the main uh, CERN seat. And the width of the Atlas director is uh, set, um, excuse me, 7,000 uh, tons. Uh, this detector, it consists of six different detecting subsystems wrapped concentrically in a layer around the collision point to record the trajectory, momentum, and energy of particles particles, allowing them to be individually identified and measured. Beam of particles from the LHC collide at the center of Atlas uh, detector, as you see here, with proton, proton, making collision debris in the form of new particles, which point in all directions. To construct the, the Atlas detector and uh, to analyze its data, an international collaboration has been established named also ATLAS. ATLAS is a worldwide collaboration of physicists, engineering, technicians, students, and support staff, of course, and more than 5,000 scientists from uh, 42 countries 
works on the Atlas experiment. And uh, Morocco joined this uh, collaboration in uh, 1996. And Morocco at this time is the only Arab country, was the only Arab uh, country and was the only African country until 2009. It is also important to highlight the research strategies chosen in this area, along with the reconstruction of the real data, a Monte Carlo simulation of the anti-experimental setup is performed following the evolution of the physical uh, processes. And the analysis compass event reconstructed from the real data with those of simulation. This involves significant, of course, computing resource. In our case, the solution was provided thanks to the worldwide LHC computing grid. To analyze uh, and to analyze all data, we have an Atlas computing model using using this WLCG, this worldwide LHC computing. The WLCG is an international collaborative project that uh, consists of a grid-based computer network infrastructure incorporating over uh, more than 170 computing centers in 42 uh, countries, member of ATLAS, of course. And um, this WSCG uh, uh, is a structure, uh, its structure is based uh, on a hierarchic tiers structure. The WSCG computing grid is made up of seat, organized into different levels. You have the level zero, the same computing center recover the raw data produced by the detector, stores it, and redistributes it at other center, which called tier level tier one. And tier one center answer the continuation of the data and carry out an initial processing before transmitting them to the other center of the other level tier two and tier uh, to three. Well, actually physical, of course, you have physical analysis. In addition of this structure in TS, a structure in cloud applies line links of interdependence between the center. It's important if you have a problem in tier one, uh, the other can do exactly the same. Uh, Morocco in Atlas. Morocco is represented by RIF. What is RIF? It's a Moroccan network of physicists from six universities in Morocco and an associate technical institution and a big center, a national center of science and nuclear physics and techniques. And we participated at the beginning in the Atlas electromagnetic presampler construction, one of the Atlas subdetector, in the insertion of the sectors of this presampler at CERN, in the data, the data taking at CERN, in data analysis, and in the establishment of Moroccan grid. And the Atlas presampler is very important, used for photon and electrons detection, and has been proven to be efficient, and is now widely used in many Atlas measurement. And in 2012, we discovered the Higgs boson. It was a very exciting moment. Thank this, to this collaboration, we in Atlas are a member of an important, uh, important discovery of this century. We have any many benefits of such participation. PhD students with a high uh, scientific level, Innovating, innovative training and technology transfer. And uh, we have the first Master of Medical Physics in Morocco, 2007, looking what's happened in the world and in CERN, of course. We have a master degree um, in computer science and scientific instrumentation in high energy physics. And uh, currently, this last year, we began a new master in radio protection. Of course, radio protection is very important in this area. All these concrete results have established 
complete confidence to this day with policymakers. Despite the change of government, it's very important. But the question we ask ourselves, have we finished the history of physics? And the answer is no, of course. What allow us to affirm this is cosmological observation. If you are interested in the infinite, be infinite big and the infinite small, you're, you will realize that the standard model only explain, explain 5% of the content of the universe. There is 25% which, which uh, could be dark matter because we don't see, it's not visible for us. And we still have no idea what is really is. And there is uh, around 70% uh, uh, black energy, no idea also what is it. it is. As dark matter had mass, so the Higgs boson should interact with it and helps perhaps to unravel the mystery of dark matter. So it is important if you want to discover a new physics to have better statistic and to have, of course, high energy at LHC and um, high intensity. It's for that we have the first phase two upgrade of the LHC. The upgrade work of the LHC is currently in progress. The high luminosity uh, uh, LHC is the phase two upgrade of the LHC and physics experimental experiments are expected to start taking data, data ideally uh, in 2028. Uh, it aims to crank up the performance of the LHC in order to increase the potential of discoveries after 2029. The objective is to increase by a factor of 10 the number of collisions produced by LHC. So uh, around one year, you can have what you have before for 10 years. It's approximately. And this, this, uh, excuse me, this LHC accelerator upgrade require a major upgrade of at the atlas detector and the other detector also in order to, to maintain the current performance capabilities and their new challenging. So we are currently participating in the of the atlas detectors in particular in the, the high granularity timing detector H, HGTD uh, which will uh, will help uh, in charge particle reconstruction and luminosity measurement. This participation is uh, in optimization and design of this uh, HGTD prototype with a view to participating in the future in the assembly part of the detector. And uh, the HGTG beam test campaign, of course, at CERN, and in the design of a microelectronic readout board. And um, uh, so several beam tests uh, were carried out currently at uh, CERN in order to choose the best detector configuration. And it is important to, to you can see that the HGTD will upgrade at last from three dimension detector to four dimension detector by pro, pro by uh, excuse me, by uh, precise time measurement about providing precise time measurement of about 30, uh, uh, 30 uh, second. Another thing very important, uh, is uh, Mohammed the, the sixth the sixth uh, university, one of uh, our network, has set up a supercomputing center, which has uh, which has already tier three, and we are trying to involve it to tier two, and this is very important for us. And uh, skill we will have skills in machine learning and application uh, useful for data analysis, and to be quick. We are trying uh, very 
quick uh, what's happened <coughs> before. Another um, last research we do, um, you know, LHT experiments are putting effort into analysis preservation. It's very important. An analysis can take months or even years for a multi-person analysis team to develop cuts that optimally curve out a face space sensitive to the model we are looking at. They want to test and estimate the standard model background and systematics in the phase space. Years later, in the future, other physicists may dream up new theories leading to alternative models that will show up <coughs> in the same or similar phase space. Since the cuts and standard model background estimates won't be affected by considering different, different signal models in the same phase space, it will be, it would probably be way faster for them just to make some tweaks to the original analysis to run it with the new model. But the original analysis, analysts have moved sometimes, moved on, and even if they can dig up the analysis code, they may not remember exactly how to use it or what sort of environment they were running. All this thing is going very, very quick. And here we use a recast. Uh, it's, a recast is a tool that automates the process passing, uh, passing of passing a new signal model through analysis when the analysis is being developed. The idea is that the data analysis can then be trivially uh, rest at any time in the future to reinterpret new signal model in the phase space that it is so carefully revealed. Here we look at the monophoton recast. So there is some colleagues from Italy who have analyzed uh, the run, uh, the full run two in monophoton and uh, monophoton, and so we are trying to reinterpret uh, the, uh, all their analysis by recast, and it's very important because uh, in this uh, model, in this model, until you could, you have um, dark matter, it will be uh, uh, if you look. It's around the dark sector, dark matter. So it's very important. It's the, the work we are doing currently. If dark photon intellect with standard model particle, they could be produced in high energy proton proton collision at the uh, uh, high luminosity LSD and can be detected by the Atlas experiment. Uh, so we are trying to, to do that, and um, it is uh, it will manifest itself in the form of an imbalance in the total energy uh, in the transverse plane of the detectors. And what is the benefit? The first one is the collaboration with CERN help us to have many other collaboration bilateral, for example, with France with Spain, with Sweden, and also with Moroccan diaspora. It's very important because we have Moroccan diaspora in all countries in the world. And after that, of course, after effort comes comfort. The first, I became the vice president of our university, Mohammed the Fifth University in Rabat. It's very important because it's like the mother, the first one in Morocco, the mother university. And in this, I, I create a, a, a university center, an university center of entrepreneurship. And this is very good because colleagues can help some student or colleagues also who have some idea to have a startup or something like that to have business plan and so on after that i have for nomination i have been nominated a resident member of the hassan second academy of science and technology in 20 
2014. And um, uh, I have was also elected as a fellow in uh, 2015 of the African Academy of Science and uh, also uh, a fellow of um, in uh, 2018, a fellow of uh, TWAS, the World Academy uh, of uh, Science for the Advanced uh, of science uh, for the uh, for uh, the in um, developing country for advancement of science in developing country and uh, also recently in 2022 i uh, i elected as a fellow of the european academy of science and art in uh, 2015 i was granted by the l'oreal unesco i awarded Unesco for women in science. It's very important because I discovered that I am the first woman in Morocco of this award, and it is important. And I, my dream is we have other young women who be awarded. It's very, very important. And when you are awarded, all people around you look at you differently, family, colleagues, and it's it can help. And uh, I am I I was honored by the the organization uh, of Islamic cooperation in um, 2017, 17, and uh, it's important for me because we are a, a country Muslim country. It's important to have this uh, uh, recognition. And something very important is to be near policy makers. I'm not in policy makers, but I can because I've been nom a nominated member of the board of trustee by different ministers um, of Moroccan Agency for Nuclear and Radiological Safety and Security, AMSNOR, so around the radiation, I know very well, and nas um, of National Center for Energy, Science and Nuclear Technology, CNESTEN, and finally, CNRSD, the National Center for Scientific and Technical Research. And this, I can give my expert uh, to this organization. And this is very important for the country. And now, now, I am a yearly member of the L'Oreal UNESCO Maghreb Fellowship. So uh, I can help young women to give them a grant for uh, one year to continue their research or uh, last year of thesis, of doctoral thesis or for postdoc. And um, and I am a member of the International Jury L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science. So now I am in the other uh, place. I, I am in the jury who choose the five women in the world first uh, ranking number one in the in the world and uh, I try always to help doctoral students to help them to to have many other activity than only their uh, subject of their thesis and uh, since uh, 2014 I am president I was I am president of uh, the national organizing committee of the French speaking context in Morocco my thesis in uh, 180 seconds. Now we are trying to have the same context in Arabic and also we will have it in English. It's very important to have the two language, it's a rich for us. And I am a member of many committees, but this, or I will talk about this war directly uh, uh, with women. I am a member of the scientific committee. Uh, of the Women's Foundation for Africa. It's uh, the Spanish Women Foundation uh, and help uh, women uh, in Africa to stay who are doctoral or in masters also, to stay uh, one year, for example, or more in an uh, uh, important center in Spain. And this is a good experience for them. And uh, all I am in Morocco, it's an uh, Arab country, but it's also African country. So I am uh, working with um, all 
my friends in Africa, colleagues in Africa, and uh, currently I am vice president of NASAC, the network uh, of African science academies uh, in Africa. And I have, I try, yeah? it's not easy, but uh, I have many actions to encourage science and women in science and in physics, of course, because I always present some physics uh, theory to help them, to, to push them to be, to, to have this. Uh, so I, I create, uh, as part of the Academy of uh, Science, uh, scientific clubs in high schools. Uh, also, I give public lecture in schools, college, high school, uh, library, engineering school, uh, university, non-governmental organization. It's very important to show that we can have, can do many things if you want. It's not easy, but we can. I am considered, of course, like a role model uh, uh, for young uh, women, and I am uh, mentoring several women. Uh, from different countries, not only Morocco. And my surprise when I discovered at the first Global Challenge contest in uh, 2017 that the medal uh, bore uh, my name, Arja Sherka will mostly uh, award for courageous achievement. And I see that it is really courage. Before, I don't realize that, but it's courage. So we need courage to do that. And we need to, to to love what we are doing, of course, to love this his work. And now I will give some conclusion and recommendation. So uh, I, I present some past and future participation to the Atlas collaboration. We have others uh, in our team, the Moroccan team. And um, from, uh, and we sh I show that from basic research, we have been able to develop many training and technology transfer program and thus participate in the development of our country and uh, increasing the impact of uh, my conclusion, increasing the impact of science and building confidence can only be achieved through science education and um, scientific mediation and the development of scientific and technical skills. This is very important. I would like here to 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 thanks to all my colleagues from Roof, from the Atlas collaboration, and from Africa, of course. And I I, I want to give some recommendation. Uh, what needs to be uh, done to achieve gender equality in physics and in science in general? I think we have first to change perception, attitude, behaviors social norms and stereotype toward women in science. This is very important. We have to engage girls and young women in, uh, in physics or science in primary and secondary education. And it's for that I always give uh, some presentation in this uh, college. And uh, we have to support women scientific through mentoring and role model, and also uh, to give them a word. It is very important to sh to show them. And we we have to strange uh, train a network of women, a uh, long force network of women scientists all over the world. And finally, we have to improve, promote, to improve measurement and policies for gender equality in physics and STEM and promote women's participation in policy makings. It's very important to have some decision for women and policy makings process, of course. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, everyone, <clears throat> for that um, for that great talk. I um, just wanted to note that the speaker 
we'll be um, we'll be collecting questions from the viewers, and the speaker will um, create a short video to respond to questions. Um, please remember to type your questions in the Q and A window, and we will pass them along to her. Thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to um, take a look at the second plenary speaker's talk. Um, this talk is given by Nathaniel Brown. Um, so I'll just read his biography. Uh, Nathaniel Brown is professor of mathematics at Penn State University in the US. After holding research positions at the um, Institute Henry Poincare um, at the University of California, Berkeley at the Math Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, Michigan State University and the University of Tokyo. His teaching has been recognized by Penn State's highest honor, the Eisenhower Teaching Award. His equity work earned a Robinson Equal Opportunity Award and a TEDx talk on, um, it was entitled, The Math People Myth. An affiliate at the Institute for a Quantitative Study of Inclusion, Diversity and Equity, QSIDE, and research associate at Penn State Center for the Study of Higher Education. He now, his research now focuses on inequity in STEM education. Hello. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here-ish with you, um, celebrating the International Conference Women in Physics. What a wonderful, uh, wonderful honor to be here with you. My name is Nate Brown. I am a professor of mathematics at Penn State University in the United States. Uh, but my area of research is actually theoretical, uh, well, it's theoretical mathematics, but it's operator algebras, something very near and dear to physics. In fact, it's a fun historical fact that um, my discipline, operator algebras, was invented and developed about 100 years ago, at the same time that quantum mechanics was being developed. And indeed, operator algebras exist because in the beginning, there was no mathematical framework for quantum mechanics. So John von Neumann, invented it, developed it, um, and here we are 100 years later. Uh, the field of operator algebra has grown into its own thing. That's what I have done for my own research. Um, so it's not quite a card-carrying physicist, but certainly uh, I'd like to think that my research is very closely aligned with everything going on at this conference. That is my math research. But I'm not here to talk to you about math research. I am actually here to talk to you about institutional sexism and racism. And so it might be a question in your mind, like, how did that happen, right? How does one go from studying operator algebras uh, to talking about institutional sexism and racism? And if you'll humor me, I'd like to tell you the story of that transition because my research now uh, over the last four or five years, my research focuses entirely on inequity in science education. Um, and so I hope that by telling you the story of my transition, two things will become clear. Uh, number one, I am a little late to this party when it comes to social justice and inequities in education. This was not the focus of the first part of my career. Um, so I'm a little late and I'm still learning but I hope that's okay. Um, we all are on this journey at different stages. So that's one thing I want to get across in my story. But the other thing um, is that I hope that by telling my story, you'll really get a sense of why this is so important to me, why I'm so passionate and I feel such urgency about equity in science, in physics, in math. Um, so yeah, I'd like to tell you my story. How is it that somebody who is trained and spends 20 years 
proving theorems about C-star algebras or Neumann algebras, how do they transition to research on equity or inequity in science education? Well, my story starts uh, around 2010. And so in 2010, I was on sabbatical and the institution that I was visiting they needed somebody to teach a math class for their elementary ed major. So these are undergraduates who are gonna go on to become elementary school teachers. And this was a new uh, group of students. You know, I, I typically just taught like, you know, calculus for engineers or math majors, graduate students. I had never taught a course for elementary ed majors and I love to teach, I always have. So it sounded quite exciting, new population of students. But I think more importantly, uh, in 2010, my daughters both were in kindergarten. So it was very exciting for me to imagine I'm going to get to teach math to my daughter's future teachers, right? So I'm excited. I happily accept the gig. You know, I, I tell the university, I'm like, I never taught this course. Can you hook me up with some faculty member there who can show me the book, talk about the course, the curriculum, et cetera? And they say, sure, sure, sure. Go see Professor X. Well, I go see Professor X. He's a theoretical mathematician, just like me. So we instantly connect, right? And I say, I'm gonna teach this course. And he's like, oh, this course, it's my baby. And it was, he had taught this course for quite a few years. He literally wrote the book that was used at that university for this course. So I'm like, perfect, like who better to talk to? Um, he gives me the book, he talks about the course and I'm all excited. And then I go back, um, my office and I start to look through the book and I'm stunned. I mean, just stunned by what I find, right? Because it's true that Professor X, like this course was his baby and he was a deeply caring and, and wonderful man. He, he cared for his students. He cared for math education. Uh, all of this is true. But when you flip through the book, there's no nice way to put it. Like it was the worst thing I've ever seen. The book started with group theory, like, you know, high level undergraduate mathematics. It started with group theory. Now, I mean, I know that many of you are familiar with group theory, but like chemistry majors, biology majors, engineering majors, basically none of these folks learn group theory. And this theoretical mathematician put it into the curriculum for elementary school teachers. I'm like, that seems a bit, you know, more than they're ready for. So I was worried, but at the same time, you know, he was a colleague and he was a theoretical mathematician. I was on sabbatical and I'd never taught the course. So I just decided, you know what, I'm going to do my best. We'll try it, see how it goes. Hopefully it won't be a disaster, but it was a disaster. I mean, I did try my best. So did the students. They worked real hard, um, but you could see the pain like in their faces every single day, they were not ready to study group theory any more than they would have been ready for quantum mechanics, right? It's high level disciplinary subject matter. So that was hard, right? That was very hard to go and teach that course <clears throat> with this material that I just felt was, was really inappropriate for those, for those students. But another very important thing happened in 2010. A stunning study was published, and in this study, researchers were looking at elementary school teachers, so the kids that were in my class, right, the, the future elementary school teachers. They were looking at elementary school teachers, and they were studying math anxiety. So they looked at elementary school teachers that had high math anxiety and those that had low math anxiety. And the question was, the research question, was if a math teacher in elementary school has high math anxiety, Will that be reflected in, say, decreased uh, performance of their students, right? Will the anxiety of the teacher be reflected in the performance of the students? Well, not surprisingly, the answer is yes. When a teacher has high math anxiety, the students tend not to do as well. But the really stunning part, the surprising part of this study was it wasn't all the students that were impacted. In fact, the little boys in this study they didn't see differences. When the little boys had a teacher with high math anxiety or low math anxiety, they didn't see differences in the boys' performance, which means, among other things, that those teachers with high math anxiety, they were actually doing a fine job teaching the material, 
right? They were teaching the math just fine. The content was coming through. The little boys were picking it up and they were performing on their exams. So what's going on? What, what explains the difference? Well, this was not a causal paper, so they couldn't uh, establish a cause, but they did lay out what I think is a very compelling theoretical argument. And it goes like this. It's a fact that children tend to emulate adults of the same gender identity. So little girls tend to emulate uh, women, little boys tend to emulate men. And so what they proposed is that what's really happening is that when an elementary school teacher has high math anxiety, the students in their class of the same gender are more likely to pick up on that anxiety, internalize that anxiety, carry it with them into their exams. And because in the United States and probably other places as well, um, the overwhelming majority of elementary school teachers are women. There's very few men who teach elementary school. This condition of anxiety passing on to students, it was really only going from the female teachers to the female students, the little boys who did not emulate their female teachers the same way. Uh, they just weren't infected with this math anxiety in the same way. So let me summarize. The year is 2010. I'm on sabbatical, essentially torturing future elementary school teachers with group theory. I can see the pain in their face when they come to class. And I learn that whatever trauma, right, horrible experiences my students have in my class, that is likely to be passed on to my daughters, but not our sons. I mean, it was, it was horrible, right? It was such a, a difficult thing. Uh, for me to learn. And I wish I could tell you that that was like the pivotal moment. It was a pivotal moment. Uh, but I wish I could tell you that that was the moment at which I just completely changed everything I do. And I, you know, committed myself to becoming the best teacher I could be and learn everything about inequity in education. But that's not what happened. What happened is I took this very uncomfortable thought that my course might have been contributing to inequities. I took that terrible thought and I tucked it into the back of my brain, deep back where I didn't have to think about it. And I went back to doing what's valued in my department, in my discipline, research, theoretical math research, right? Let's just say it at major research institutions like Penn State, like many of the institutions you come from, we pay lip service to high quality teaching, right? But when it comes time for promotion and tenure, Really, the only thing that matters is how many papers, where, how many grants. It's all about the research. That's what's valued in practice. So that's what I did. You know, I did learn some things, right? I mean, you know how it works. If you take a really awful thought and you tuck it into the back of your brain, it doesn't actually go away. It just kind of sits there and festers and grows. And that's what happened to me. And I, I certainly learned to be a, a better teacher. I started to experiment with uh, new teaching methods and so on. But I didn't really commit to change. I didn't really commit to taking a social justice perspective into all of my work. That didn't happen until around 2016. Because in 2016, another stunning study was published. And this study was about calculus at the undergraduate level, the course I teach you know, almost every year. And what this study found was that when you look at uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, when you look at STEM majors, uh, they don't, you know, the pathways to STEM majors are, are full of places where students drop out. And it is a fact, according to the study, that about 1.5, women are about 1.5 times more likely to leave a STEM pathway after taking calculus than men, right? So engineering, biology, chemistry, physics, math, all of these majors are losing more women than men after calculus, the course I taught all the time. And this was just devastating. This hits like a hammer, right? Because I cannot live with the fact or the idea or the possibility that the courses I'm teaching are making things worse, exacerbating inequities, right? 
and this I have to say, I'm so not proud of this fact, but it is true, right? The difference between the 2010 study and 2016 study was that the 2010 study was about elementary school teachers, and I only taught that course once. I never taught it before sabbatical, and I haven't taught it since. So it didn't quite apply to me. I mean, it did one semester, and that was it. But the 2016 study, that one applied to me every single year, right? That was my bread and butter, and I couldn't ignore it anymore. And that really was the point at which I committed to transition. My research was no longer going to be about operator algebras. It was going to be about inequities in STEM education, trying to lever the playing field, trying to make the education system a more inclusive place for everybody so that everybody with the right talent, drive, motivation, skills can be successful. So that's why I am here today, or that's the story of my transition, I should say, which led to me being here today to talk to you about uh, institutional sexism and racism. And with that, I will share my screen and proceed with that part of the talk. So institutional racism and sexism in science. Let me begin by telling you what I mean by that. Uh, institutional racism and sexism, these are policies, practices, cultural norms at an institution or in a discipline um, that result in unfair advantage for some based on their race or their sex, okay? And we have to distinguish this from sort of the easily observable classic racism or sexism, right? This is not like neo-Nazi rallies, which are super easy to identify and say, oh, there's the racist. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here are things that are more subtle, more difficult to identify because they're embedded into our everyday ecosystems, our working uh, ecosystems, the institutions that we uh, work at and thrive at. So it's a little bit more difficult sometimes to identify, to study, to correct things like institutional racism and sexism because these policies and practices, as I say, are, are embedded in our uh, work ecosystems. But that's what I'm here to talk about. Some of the policies and practices and norms and cultures at institutions, uh, specifically higher ed institutions that result in unfair advantage for some based on their race or their sex. And the first question I want to address is, can we measure this? Can we measure the impacts of this? Even if we don't quite understand all of the influences yet, can we at least put a number, some sort of metric, um, that really demonstrates that this is a real thing. And so this uh, first study I wanna talk about, this was a study carried out, I carried this out with uh, two colleagues, Neil Hatfield and Chad Topaz. And in our study, we wanted to look at some hypothetical students. Now, our study was actually intersectional, so we, we looked at uh, five race, ethnicity categories, two gender categories. I'm only showing you two of the 10 possibilities, or you know, white men, uh, white women in this study, Hispanic men, Hispanic women in this study, and so on. So I'm only showing you two of the 10 possibilities in our study. But here's the basic idea. Imagine you have two brand new high school graduates. Right? They just graduated, they come to your university, they show up at the dorm for fall semester. And these two hypothetical students, they have identical uh, preparation in high school according to two very common metrics that are used for admissions, for instance. Right? The first metric that we considered was the high school grade point average. And the second is the ACT. This in the United States is a standardized exam. It's given nationally. They're sort of falling out of fashion these days, which I'm very happy about. But nonetheless, it's still a very common metric uh, of high school preparation. So our two hypothetical students, they have identical uh, high school preparation according to these two metrics, GPA and the standardized exam score. And in case you're wondering why we chose those numbers, a GPA of 3.57 and an ACT score of 26, we chose those numbers for our hypothetical students because both of these hypothetical students declared a STEM major, science, technology, engineering, or math, uh, when they entered university. And those numbers, 3.57 and 26, those are the averages in our data set. So what you're looking at here 
are absolutely prototypical incoming science students or STEM majors, okay? All right, what else? Well, our two hypothetical students not only have identical preparation in high school and both declared a STEM major, but both of them were successful in all of their first semester undergraduate uh, STEM courses. So think of your calculus class, think of your first semester physics class or chemistry class, right? Our two hypothetical students uh, got C's or better, they were successful, were able to go on to the next level in all of their first semester college classes. Okay, what's the question? The question is, what's the chance four years down the line, five years down the line, that these two hypothetical students actually get a degree in STEM? And in our data set, the answer was 48% chance if you're a white male, but only 28% chance if you're a black female. And I need to pause to just sit with this because this is a horrific disparity, right? This was just, I mean, I was expecting when we did this work to have a disparity, I did not expect it would be this drastic. So let me say a few words about this study. Um, our work was based on the complete student transcripts of 110,000 students in the United States. All of them were at major research institutions. Um, so we had a very large N for our study. Uh, but the thing that really I need to drive home here is that when we try to explain this disparity, and that's the next step, right? We've identified and we've measured a disparity, and now we have to try to understand where did that come from? How come these 28%, 48%, they're so different? When we try to explain it, what we cannot do, what we cannot do is we cannot try to explain this by saying there were differences in the high school preparation. We can't because we controlled for that, right? Both of our hypothetical students had the same uh, ACT and, and high school GPA too, as I say, very common metrics used for college admissions, for instance. So we can't blame K through 12 preparation. We can't blame this disparity on differences between men and women and interest in science. We can't do that because both of them declared a science major when they came in. And we can't blame this disparity on differences in the so-called weed out courses at university, like college calculus, like intro physics, intro uh, chemistry. We can't blame those first semester difficult courses that are often used to weed students out because our hypothetical students were successful in all of them. So this leads me to a very uncomfortable conclusion, right? Because if we were operating in a genuinely equitable university system, higher education system, right? When two students come to us and they have the same high school preparation, they have the same interest in some discipline, and they are both equally successful in their first semester college classes, right? If we were really in an equitable system, those two students ought to have very similar probabilities of graduating. And that's not what happens. 28 percent and 48 percent are not close right so something is happening at university right we cannot blame k-12 we cannot blame it's happening at university uh, that's causing this great disparity so the point is um, that even though we don't fully understand all of the influences and ways in which institutional racism and sexism um, impact our students there is no doubt that uh, there is advantage being of a certain gender of a certain race uh, when you come to higher education. So that's a measurement we can take. And then the next question is, well, okay, what are all the many influences, right? What are the ways in which our institutions are contributing to sexism, to racism, to disparities, to inequity? And there's many, many factors here. I don't wanna oversimplify this, right? There's many, many factors from the way we hire, the way we mentor, there's tons, but I'm going to focus on people like me. I'm gonna focus on STEM faculty, physics faculty, math faculty, and the ways in which we as faculty are contributing to institutional sexism and racism. And the first one I wanna talk about is a belief about intellectual ability, about intelligence, 
Okay, so there are a couple concepts in, in psychology. One is called a fixed mindset, and a fixed mindset is when somebody believes that intellectual ability is more or less fixed at birth. It's sort of written in your DNA, and there's not much you can do about it. You have a fixed amount of intellectual ability, and as I say, it's just sort of part of you when you're born. This is to be contrasted with a growth mindset, and in the growth mindset, uh, now one believes that intellectual ability is something that grows. It grows through training, it grows through hard work, practice, persistence, et cetera. But it's, it's not something that's sort of written in your DNA. It's more like your brain is a muscle and you can make it stronger through exercise and training and so on. And I have to say here, I'm not a neuroscientist, but the, the research that I've read around neuroplasticity uh, to me, absolutely suggests that the growth mindset is a more accurate view of human intellectual abilities. But whatever, this is what people believe. This is a couple options for what people believe about intellectual ability. Now, why are we talking about beliefs of faculty about intellectual ability? Because in 2019, a very important study was done and in this study, researchers looked at about 150 STEM faculty, people just like me, and they looked at the grades of about 15,000 students in the classes of you know, that 150 STEM faculty. And what they did is they, they took the STEM faculty and they separated them into two groups, the STEM faculty who have a, a fixed mindset and the STEM faculty who have a growth mindset. What you should think of here is that study at the uh, elementary school level with teachers who have high math anxiety or low math anxiety, okay? They took these STEM instructors this time and they put them in two different bins according to a fixed or a growth mindset. And then they looked at grades uh, of the students in their classes. But they went a step further, right? They went a step further. They didn't just look at the grades of everybody. They took the students in those instructors' classes and they separated them into white and Asian students and URM, underrepresented minorities, which in the United States uh, means black students, Hispanic students, indigenous, native uh, American students, right? So they take the students in these classes, they separate them uh, according to their race, ethnicity, and then they looked at the, the grades that the instructors gave and what they found was that when a STEM instructor has a fixed mindset, a typical URM student got a B minus in their course. And when a uh, STEM instructor has a growth mindset, a typical URM student got a B. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first heard that what an instructor believes about intellectual ability could be reflected in the grades of their students, I was stunned. That's not something that I would have guessed would be reflected. When they say math anxiety is reflected in the student's performance, like that was easier for me to wrap my head around, but this was a stunning study for me. Why, why does a, a faculty member's belief about intellectual ability, how is that uh, influencing students' grades? And they actually did a follow-up study to this um, where they showed that when an instructor has a growth mindset, the students in their class actually have higher levels of belonging, of self-efficacy. So it's absolutely something that instructors are transmitting down to their students in subtle ways. And this is being reflected uh, in the performance of their students. And clearly, if an instructor's belief is uh, resulting in lower grades for underrepresented students, that is a big problem. And here I have to say, uh, this study is also very close to my heart because it turns out that mathematics is a discipline where you find very high percentages of faculty believing uh, that intelligence is fixed. They have a fixed mindset. In fact, there was a study um, and they found that really mathematics and philosophy were the two disciplines with the highest percentage of um, folks who have a sort of fixed mindset when it comes to intellectual ability. So this is very disturbing for me, right? This is a very, very disturbing uh, contributor to institutional sexism and racism. Another 
thing that we have to talk about is implicit bias. Now, the, the body of literature around implicit bias now is absolutely enormous. Our, our colleagues in psychology have studied this forever, and every experiment has been replicated in umpteen different uh, contexts with different populations. Like It is now an established fact that if you are human, you carry implicit bias. It's that simple. We all have it. We were all infected with implicit biases of many, many different types. Uh, through our upbringing, through our social programming, through the cultural norms that we were raised in. So it's not a question of whether we have implicit bias. It's a question of whether those implicit biases are reflected in our actions, in the things we do. So there have been some randomized control trials, and that is the gold standard for this type of science. There were randomized control trials that looked at STEM faculty, <clears throat> and let me explain this experiment to you that they did. Uh, in 2012, researchers created a resume for a lab manager. So, you know, imagine you have your own physics lab. You don't have to imagine that, many of you, right? You have your own physics lab, and you'd like to hire a lab manager to run your lab. So researchers created a fictitious resume, and then they took that resume, and they made two versions of it. And the only difference between those two versions was that one of them had a male name at the top and one of them had a female name at the top. Everything else was literally word for word identical. OK, so you've got identical resumes, one with a male name, one with a female name. Then they randomly choose a ton of STEM faculty. They send half of the STEM faculty the, the resume with the male name. They send half of the faculty the resume with the female name, and then they ask those faculty to rate the applicant, send back their reports. Well, what they found was that the faculty, the STEM faculty, who thought they were looking at a man's application, rated the applicant higher in all categories than those who thought they had a woman's resume. And in fact, when it came time to make an offer, the faculty who thought they were going to hire a man offered a 14% higher starting salary than the faculty who thought they were uh, going to hire a woman. So implicit bias is in STEM faculty. We are human. That's not a surprise. But not only is it in us, it is reflected in the decisions we make, in the way we assess uh, applicants for a lab manager position. Now, this study was really influential, um, got a ton of press because it's such an important piece of work. And then, quite naturally, researchers said, well, can we replicate it? Can we extend it? And that happened in 2019. And this time, uh, researchers actually looked at both biology and physics uh, faculty, but I'll just talk about physics since we're here at the Women in Physics Conference. right? And this time, they did basically the same thing. They created um, a, a resume, but this time it was a resume for a postdoc. Okay, So these are physics faculty who are going to look at a postdoc application. And this study was intersectional. So they didn't just look at women versus men. They had four race categories, white, Asian, uh, Hispanic, and Black, and then the two sex categories. So they actually created eight resumes, identical in every way, except at the top of one resume was a white male name. At the top of another resume was a white female name. Another one was Hispanic female, Hispanic male, et cetera, okay? So they've got eight resumes identical except the race and gender of the name at the top. They send it out to physics faculty, ask them to report back on the, um, you know, to assess the, the, the applicant. And what they found is that physics faculty did indeed rate these applicants differently based on the race and sex of the name at the top. And they found that the least hireable were Hispanic applicants and Black women. OK, just let that sink in. These are people just like me, just like you. We were looking at postdoc applications, and we rated them differently based on the name, whether we thought it was a, a male or whether we thought it was a white or an Asian or, or Hispanic. OK? And again, these are randomized control trials, the highest standard of evidence in this sort of work. So that's another contributor to institutional sexism and racism, right? The way we faculty assess our students. 
our colleagues, our uh, graduate students, postdocs, et cetera. Um, very uncomfortable stuff, but we have to face it. We have to sit with these things. The last thread I want to talk about, and this one is, of course, very close to my heart. I hope my opening story made it clear that I am now very, very concerned about teaching, um, about how we train our teachers, the sort of teaching that we do. Um, and so let's acknowledge, let's acknowledge a sort of elephant in the room, right? When it comes to teaching, when I was in graduate school, I got a ton of training in, in theoretical math research. I got zero training in how to teach. I mean, I think I had like a one hour workshop, <laughs> which is hilarious because you, you know, teaching is, there's so many facets. What are you going to learn in an hour? The answer is you learn how to write a quiz and how to keep a, a spreadsheet with grades, right? Like that's pretty much it. So essentially we get no training in teaching in graduate school. And then we're thrown into a course and they go teach, go teach calculus. So what do you do? I mean, of course, what you do is you mimic the teaching that you grew up with, that's familiar, that's comfortable for you. And that's what I did. And again, I don't know about you, but I'll bet we're the same here, right? Almost all of the teaching I encountered through high school, through college, through graduate school, almost all of it was traditional lecture. A person walks into the room, they stand at the front, they are the sage on the stage, and they just pontificate right? They just talk at you. They might ask a few questions. There might be a little bit of interaction, but for the most part, traditional lecture is a person walks in, talks at the audience, and then they walk out. That's what I grew up with. That's what was familiar. That's what I did when I uh, first started teaching. I did that for actually quite a few years. This is antiquated. This method of teaching is old school and not in a good way. In fact, our colleagues in education, people who actually study education, people who study how students learn, what's the best way to teach and so on, they have known for a long time that traditional lecture, sage on the stage, is an inferior method of teaching. In fact, they've done so much work in this area that you can now do meta-analyses. You can look at the body of literature on active learning, which is anything that's not traditional lecture. I mean, active learning is a, it's a sort of umbrella term. And so I don't want to get into exactly what it means, but for the purpose of this talk, let's just think of active learning as anything that isn't traditional lecture. Okay. That's not quite accurate, but it's close enough, right? So our, our friends in education, our colleagues in education, they have produced an enormous body of work that shows that active learning practices, whatever they look like in your classroom, these are superior teaching methods and it will be reflected in the performance of your student. You'll see there that that paper was published uh, in 2014. But then researchers decided to do a similar sort of thing, but with a social justice and equity perspective. And they went back and they did another meta-analysis of all of the work that's been done. And what they found is that traditional lecture is not just inferior for all students, but it's particularly inferior for our underrepresented students in the sense that as soon as you start to use more modern, more effective teaching methods, gaps in performance between white students and underrepresented students, between men and women, like all of these gaps in performance shrink, okay? So modern teaching methods not are just better for everyone, but they are particularly impactful if you take a social justice or equity lens because they help level the playing field. And this to me is, again, a very disturbing but super important piece of work that we all need to just sit with because these are ways in which we faculty are contributing to institutional sexism and racism, not with malice in mind, but nonetheless, right, if we're using teaching methods that exacerbate uh, inequity, then we are contributing to it, whether we intend to, whether we want to or not, we are. So faculty, people just like me, people just like many of you, uh, we are not just working in um, an inequitable ecosystem, but in many cases, we have been contributing to it. I know I certainly have contributed to it in ways that I'm not at all proud of, but I do need to acknowledge because it's a fact. 
So what do we do, right? Once we see the evidence for institutional sexism and racism, and once we see a few of the ways in which it manifests itself, right, through our teaching, through our implicit biases and so on, I believe what we feel, what we are compelled to do with this new information is to take our institutions and put them under the microscope. Because all of a sudden we can't assume that what we're doing is race neutral, is gender neutral, is equitable. We can't assume that. In fact, I would say we now have to sort of assume the opposite, that maybe everything we're doing uh, at least deserves scrutiny, at least deserves being put under the microscope to see are our practices really um, equitable or are they making things worse? And let me just give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Curriculum. What if we took the curriculum that we teach our students and we put that under the microscope, right? Like for instance, is it really a good idea to teach group theory to future elementary school teachers? Like the theoretical mathematician that put that in the curriculum, like was that a good idea? Probably not. In fact, that probably caused a lot of harm, right? That piece of the curriculum. And maybe you're thinking, well, but I don't teach elementary ed majors. Okay, fair, but are you sure that the curriculum in your physics class isn't having some sort of unintended, unseen, inequitable effects? Until you put it under the microscope, you cannot be sure, right? So I'm, I'm calling for genuine reassessment of our entire curriculum, looking for things that might be making things worse, whether we realize it, intend it, doesn't matter. I just want to know, are we making things better? Are we making things worse? Pedagogy, the way we teach. I guess I've already talked about this, so maybe I'll go quickly, but right, I do think we need to own the fact that we don't train our teacher, our, our graduate students, our future teachers, and therefore they replicate the same methods that they're used to, and that leads to inequity. That's something we really need to wrestle with. <clears throat> How about policies? Are there policies that we need to be reconsidering? For instance, is it really a good idea to let theoretical mathematicians develop the curriculum without any consultation from experts in education? I mean, let this sink in, right? A theoretical mathematician who has no training in education, just like me, was allowed to construct this curriculum and they didn't have to consult with any education experts. And, and the criminal part here is that we have education experts. Right? Like math education is a real discipline. Physics education is a real discipline. There are genuine, brilliant scholars doing this work, and we could reach out to them for consultation. But we don't. Right? How about the policy of really only valuing research and only paying lip service to teaching? Is that a policy that uh, creates equity, or is it one that exacerbates disparities? Lots of policies we could put under the microscope here. How about assessment? And what I mean here is assessment of, of teaching, um, but it would also make sense for assessment of, you know, training our, our, our mentees, whether it's grad students, postdocs, but let me just talk about assessment of teaching, right? I don't know how it works at your institution, but at Penn State and at every other major uh, US institution that I'm familiar with, when a new faculty member is hired, when the department wants to assess the quality of their teaching, what they do is they go find an old member of the department, somebody who only does traditional lecture, who has zero training in education, who probably thinks that education research is intellectually inferior work, looks down on it, right? If we're being honest, a lot of theoretical researchers don't have a high opinion of education research. So to assess the quality of a new faculty member, they find an old faculty member who knows nothing about education, thinks that, you know, traditional methods are the best ones. That's the assessor. That's the person that goes and judges the quality of teaching of the young faculty member. Is that a good idea? I don't know. I don't think so. But these are the sorts of institutional structures, policies, norms. <clears throat> that we need to put under the microscope and ask really hard critical questions and then try to make changes if we feel that that's what's needed. But I want to emphasize that these are just examples that come up to me 
in my context, in the things that are very, that I feel very passionate about, right? Teaching and so on. In your context, whether you work in industry, right? Whether you work at a research institute with no teaching, the context is going to be different, but you still work at some sort of an institution in some sort of a, a culture with its own norms, with its own policies and so on. What would be the institutional structures in your context that need to be examined? This is something I hope everyone will think about individually, in groups, at your institution, with your friends, with your colleagues, right? We all have to take a critical view of the institutions, the ecosystems that we work in and we contribute to. And we have to ask ourselves really hard questions. And those questions will be different depending on the context. But I can assure you, once you start to go down this path, it's like the floodgate opens. And as soon as you identify one or two structures, institutional norms, et cetera, more and more will follow. So I highly encourage everyone to take some time uh, to think about institutional issues in your particular context that might need to be under the microscope uh, and then be assessed for equity or rather inequity. Okay, but let's suppose we do that work. We identify a bunch of things and we say, oh, this needs change, that needs change. Well, that's good. That's, that's certainly an important first step, but then we have to make the change. And that's really hard because we're talking about institutions and institutions are old, they have history, they are comprised of many, many people, right? Changing an institution is incredibly hard to do. It can be done, but it's hard to do. And I wanna talk about what I view is the single greatest obstruction to change, the single greatest preventative uh, measure, if you will, supporting the status quo. And that is those who benefit most from the status quo. Those who benefit most from the status quo are, in my opinion, the greatest obstruction to changing the institutions that we need, the, the changes we need to make to our institutions um, to create equitable learning environments. So let me be specific. I'm specifically talking about established faculty, people just like me with gray hair who've been around for quite a few years, right? We are the ones who benefit the most from the status quo. And it is faculty uh, with influence and power and history who are the greatest obstruction to progress in my mind. And that's not, I don't say that lightly. Right. This is something that's um, very disturbing for me, um, and I have been a part of it. You know, early in my career, I didn't make the changes that I wish I would have. I wish I could go back and relive a few years of my life. Um, so I'm. This is not coming from a holier than thou place. Right. I'm afraid I have been part of this issue, and I'm still growing. I'm sure there's many things that I I will look back ten years from now and go, oh, that was not great. I wish I wouldn't have done that. In any case, um, faculty, right? Established faculty, these, these folks, myself included, we are some of the biggest uh, supporters of the status quo. But I want to make it very clear. I'm not suggesting that those who benefit the most from the status quo have malicious intent. They don't. I certainly never had malicious intent when I didn't change the way I teach, right? But whether your intent is malicious or whether your intent is pure, if you're doing something and it has inequitable consequences, if your behaviors are exacerbating uh, disparities, it doesn't matter if you're malicious or not, right? The result is the same. For the students who are being mistreated, who are experiencing inequities, your intent is irrelevant. So I'm not painting uh, the picture that, you know, faculty who prevent progress have bad intent, but I'm also saying I don't care what their intent is. They're still preventing progress. And we, as a community, need to uh, address this. Let me give you an example, a very high profile example from 2019. So in 2019, uh, Dr. Abigail Thomas, Thompson, rather, um, 
who was a vice president for the American Mathematical Society. That's the largest professional organization of mathematicians on the planet. So Dr. Thompson was a vice president for the American Mathematical Society, and she wrote a very controversial op-ed railing against diversity statements. So let me set the context for you here. Diversity statements are something that came up in the context of hiring. So if you apply for a job, a tenure track job or a research position or whatever, right? You have to submit a bunch of stuff with your application. You have to submit a research statement that describes what your research is, what your research plans are. You have to describe, you have to submit a teaching statement if you're going for a tenure track job that involves teaching. Uh, and that also describes, you know, your teaching philosophy, your experience and so on. But in the University of California system where uh, Dr. Thompson worked, they were also requiring a diversity statement. And this requires applicants to talk about their views on equity, uh, their experiences, and so on. So the problem, according to Dr. Thompson, was that she believes that a research statement makes sense for hiring, a teaching statement makes sense, but she was opposed to using diversity statements. She didn't think that had any place in the decision-making process for who to hire. And I have to say, the comparisons she drew, I mean, this is all public. You can go Google this, right? I'm not spreading secrets here. She literally compared these diversity statements to loyalty oaths from the Red Scare, like the communist Red Scare in the 1950s. Like, it was insane. It was just crazy. But whatever. She was a vice president of the American Mathematical Society, so her op-ed gets published railing against these diversity statements. Well, as you can imagine, this led to an uproar. Like mathematicians across the, the, the country, certainly, and even some internationally, uh, wrote letters, many supporting Dr. Thompson and her crusade against diversity statements, uh, many opposed, and I'm talking hundreds and hundreds, and all of this is public. You can Google all of this, right? So hundreds and hundreds of mathematicians weigh in. Many of them signed existing open letters. Many of them wrote their own letters. Anyway, tons of mathematicians weigh in. And I just want to focus on what the most powerful, influential mathematicians on the planet had to say about this. And those are our Fields Medalists. So we don't have a Nobel Prize in mathematics. Our Nobel Prize is called the Fields Medal. And quite a few Fields Medalists um, decided to weigh in on whether they were aligned with Dr. Thompson or whether they were opposed to her crusade. And what happened was 10 Fields Medalists wrote in assigned open letters aligned with Dr. Thompson, very much against the use of diversity statements in hiring. So, that's what the highest profile folks had to say uh, on that side. And then on the other side, we asked how many Fields Medalists decided to be in favor? And the answer there is zero. Not a single Fields Medalist decided to come out in favor of more information when hiring, right? Not a single one. I'm not saying that none of them felt that way, but I am saying none of them had the courage of their convictions to go public and say, that they agreed with the use of diversity statements. And this was just uh, so demoralizing for me. It's just so demoralizing to be a mathematician and to know that the most impactful, influential people in my field uh, were lined up you know, against diversity statements. But that's what happened in 2019. Now, that's a very high profile example. Um, and most of us won't encounter that hopefully too many times in our career, but you will have day-to-day -day incidents with colleagues um, where progress is prevented, inaction is the norm. And if I could only recommend one paper for you to read, it would be this one. This is just a brilliant paper. And um, I just want to talk about some of the results, what they found uh, in this paper. They talked to well-intentioned white male physicists and they ask them about issues of inequity, uh, their own contributions to correcting course or whatever. And what they found is that even well-intentioned, progressive-minded uh, white male physicists come up with a lot of reasons 
that they don't do much or they don't know much. And you probably encountered some of these, but if not, let me tell you some of the themes that came up. Many well-intentioned white male physicists will tell you, uh, yes, inequity is real and it's a real problem, but it doesn't happen in my department, it doesn't happen in my lab, it doesn't happen in my discipline, right? This is an everyday example of how the people who benefit the most from uh, the status quo don't do anything um, to fix it. Another thing that you'll hear well-intentioned white male physicists say is that this problem is just too big. You know, it has to do with high school preparation, K through 12, it's socioeconomic issues, it's rooted in history, like there's just nothing we can do, it's just too big. Another, uh, and that, that is a very common example of rationalizing, but there are other ways uh, that well-intentioned white men and others rationalize inaction, right? They say things like, I don't know what to do, or talking about this makes people uncomfortable. In any case, these are the day-to-day -day ways that people with good intentions and who voice openly support for equity and progressive uh, policies and such, these are the day-to-day -day ways in which they actually support the status quo, prevent uh, us from making progress. So how are we gonna make progress? What are we gonna do? Well, um, you know, it's gonna look different in, in my context, in your context, at your institution, my institution, in your level of seniority, my level of, it's always gonna look different, but there are some very important common threads that I wanna talk about. How do we make progress dismantling these racist and sexist structures? Well, first and foremost, we have to do this together. This is not a one person job. This is a huge endeavor to change institutions, to change cultural norms. We must do it together as a group, kind of like this conference, right? Wonderful. We have to take care of ourselves. This is very demoralizing, difficult work, as I'm sure you uh, know all too well, right? Dealing with microaggressions, macroaggressions on a day to day basis. It takes its toll. It's hard to go to work under those circumstances every single time. So we have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of each other. We have to protect each other. We have to stand shoulder to shoulder. If you see a microaggression, if you hear a sexist joke at a conference, right? We have to be good bystanders and stand up, stand with each other in those difficult moments. We have to show appreciation for each other. This is such a small thing, but it can make such a big difference, right? If you have a student who's doing good work, a, a colleague who's doing good work, tell them. Tell them to their face. Tell them today. Don't wait. Tell them today. I appreciate you. I love what you're doing. I see you. In a community, this makes all the difference in the world. And finally, we need to celebrate because there's so much to celebrate. There really is. I mean, it's easy to get overwhelmed. I fall victim to it too, but there is so much to celebrate. Everybody in this room, at this conference across the globe, you are all reasons to celebrate, right? And we need to support each other, lift each other. When you have a student who graduates or does well on an exam, when you publish a paper, you collect new data that seems compelling, all these are reasons to celebrate. Don't miss the opportunities. <laughs> the celebration is super, super important. So with that, I would like to thank you again for having me. It's an incredible honor to be here. And I, for one, am so happy to be able to celebrate with you the eighth annual International Conference on Women in Physics. And I wish you just the most uh, rewarding and successful conference. Thank you. April, you're muted. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for um, watching these two great talks. Um, I see that there are, um, I'll take a couple of questions um, quickly. I see there are a couple in the Q&A. Um, let's see. One asks, which factor do you think affects the bias and inequity in STEM education the most? Um, and does it change in a rapidly changing society? 
Um, so from not only listening to this talk, but because um, I know Nate's work um, very well and have talked to him about uh, this talk in particular, I think he really wanted to drive home the personal responsibility and the collective responsibility that um, those of us with the most power and the most privilege have. So in the US context and in many other, um, those are typically white men. Um, and it's really the point he emphasized toward the, be toward the end of the talk, especially that intention is far outweighed by impact. So regardless of any good intentions, if you're having a negative impact, that's what you need to focus on and address. And despite how rapidly changing things seem to be, um, that is not something that has moved very much um, in all the time social scientists have been studying these difficult issues of inequity. Um, let's see, the second question is, how can an intellectual ability of a teacher be passed on fruitfully to his students? Um, and yeah, I think, I think just based on the ideas that Nate talked about, um, aside from the very specific evidence about mindset, I think, it really is about um, creating a learning environment that is accessible and equitable. Um, the evidence that he presented showed, again, that um, not only having things like a growth mindset, but looking at research-based um, approaches, engaged, active learning approaches have a disproportionate effect on the people who experience, the students who experience the most harm. Um, so it's not about passing on intellectual ability as if it's a one-way valve. It really is about learning um, the best ways, working with people who, whose professionalism centers learning and figuring out the best ways to create environments for learning for your students. How are we doing on time? I know his talk was a bit long. We are okay. Yeah, we are okay. You can take the questions if there. Okay. Uh, we may give a couple of minutes for people to type in if they want still. Okay. Yeah, I um, I'm seeing uh, Francisca's. Uh, question about how we can implement how we can implement some of the suggestions that um, that Dr. Brown makes. And again, I think it's really working with um, each other um, and really breaking down um, what he characterized as the low opinion many traditional physicists have for the work of education researchers and social scientists who've been studying these phenomena for a long time. Any other question? Maybe we can close them if there are no more questions. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. Okay. But um, if anyone thinks of them, they can feel free to send them along and I'm happy to share them with, um, with Nate. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the first plenary session of EQUIP 2023. I would like to thank uh, Raja Sherkavi and Mursil and Nathaniel Brown for two very interesting talks and also to share their journey with us. I also thank Dr. April for chairing the session as well as handling the questions for Dr. Brown. 
Now, I I am very happy to announce that apart from the APPS meeting, which has been already announced, there will be regional meetings from all other regions tomorrow uh, between 10 to 11:30 uh, IST, and we will be sending the information on that, and we will update the. Uh, web page uh, with this information. So here is a request to all the participants that please join the regional meetings uh, of your region. Okay, thank you. Bye everyone. See you.